This is going to be cool because it's going to be a real eye opener for hobbyists. A lot of people don't know about, you know, what else we do for global aquaculture. Hi, Chad. Welcome. And why don't we start off by you telling me a little bit about Reed Mariculture? Well, it's uh, great that you're having me on in this video. I really appreciate it, Kelly. Um, I'm sitting here in my office at, at the farm in, uh, in California, in Campbell, California. And uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk with my viewers. So uh, for all of you that are tuning in, I appreciate it. So again, my name is Chad Clayton. I'm the Live Feed Supervisor for Reed Mariculture. I've been with uh, RMI for about nine years now. Um, my career has been focused mainly on marine biology and aquaculture. Um, I went to college down in Florida Tech back in the 90s and uh, decided to, to stick with aquaculture because it was an up-and-coming profession and I saw a lot of value in, in it, especially with marine ornamentals, uh, clownfish specifically. Uh, so I decided to uh, uh, leave college, go get experience as much as I could, working with Department of Fisheries in Indiana, doing uh, lakes and rivers uh, and stream surveying, doing electrofishing, which was really cool. Um, I worked in a laboratory doing molecular biology and aquaculture at uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. So I learned in vitro fertilization techniques. It was cool because we were literally stripping the eggs and the sperm out of the females and males, fertilizing them in petri dishes, and then gr literally growing them in beakers. Um, so that was like my real first experience with, with breeding fish uh, on a very, uh, very high level. Um, and then uh, I was working at, uh, in St. Louis. I was trying to get down to Florida to work for ORA because, you know, they were a big clownfish hatchery at the time, still are. And, uh, and I really wanted to get down there and get some more experience with marine ornamentals. So uh, I spoke with them, did some interviewing, went down there, and I got hired. And so uh, I worked there for about four years and learned a lot. I got a lot of species under my belt. I, I bred a number of uh, clownfish and dottybacks and cardinals. Even started working with seahorses down there, which was really fun. Really enjoyed working. Well, now that's cool. <laughs> I really enjoyed working with the, the uh, Bori uh, seahorses. Those were my favorite. Um, and then, and then I had an opportunity uh, of a lifetime to go out to Hawaii and and grow fish at a at an inland hatchery, and they had an offshore uh, cages for grow out. And and so I just I left everything behind and and moved to Hawaii, and had ne having never been there before in my life. So it was really cool a lot of experience with with larva rearing breeding uh breeding we had brood stocks we were collecting eggs we were hatching eggs and this is where i really got a uh, good experience with copepods and to lead me into you know what we're going to talk about today so so that was in 2006 so for a couple of years i was out in hawaii learned a lot about copepods um and then things changed you know i met i met my future wife she's from california so decided to leave the island and move to to california to really settle down and and, uh, you know, put an end to my gypsy aquaculture career, so to speak, because I was literally drifting around from job to job, just gaining experience and trying to figure out where I wanted to be and, and one of the, what I wanted to do in the future, which is the case with most of us. You know, I was very happy to move to California, and I remembered that Reed Mariculture was in the area. Um, and so I called them up, sent in my resume, and after a few uh, pretty intense interviews with the Reed family, uh, I got in and, and haven't looked back. And so they brought me in to uh, really refine the protocols and techniques with the Tigger Pods, which uh, is their top seller. It's one of the most popular copepods in the reef aquarium hobby, Tigriopus californicus. Uh, these animals are found from Alaska all the way down to the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. Uh, they have a huge range, so it was really fun to, uh, to try to really refine the protocols, figure out what makes these animals tick uh, with a lot of observation, a lot of different techniques and, and uh, experimentation and, you know, with, an, with aquaculture. You want to make small changes over time. You don't want to change a lot of things. You want to change one thing at a time to figure out what works. Uh, and and recently, within the past three or four years, we've really nailed down our protocols with Tigriopus californicus, and uh, and we're producing a lot of them. Actually, we're overproducing them. And so seasonally, we come out with a product that's Tigger Feast. That's you know they're concentrated uh, Tigger pods. And so that kind of segued into more copepod species, so that we could culture more copepods for other uh, facilities that maybe needed a pelagic copepod with a small monopoli or a copepod that non viable algae, things like that. So so those are things that I'm continuing to work on here while I'm also doing the social media. I go to a lot of trade shows. I do presentations on a number of different topics. It's really cool to to talk about global aquaculture with hobbyists uh, because, it, you know, a lot of there's a lot of overlap what people are doing in global aquaculture as well as marine ornamental aquaculture for the hobby. Uh, and so it's it's really cool to be a part of literally both worlds. So yeah, that's kind of 
where I'm at now and, uh, and the future is, you know, more live feeds research uh, and refining techniques and protocols and, and helping people succeed uh, better than they ever have. So that's kind of where I'm at now. They made a very good decision hiring you because I've personally seen you at MACNA, at MBI, at all of so many different types of the shows and stuff, and, and you're always so energetic and ready to talk to anybody and explain, and you're very understanding of the fact that hobbyists or newcomers or whatever, however you want to say it, might not know as much as someone else that you speak to. So you, you're very, very good at making sure that I understand what you're saying. So I appreciate that. With Reed, you just explained exactly what you are doing and your progression through it. What would you say is their main focus? Is there is there any specific goal of the company? So, so yeah, I can tell you a little bit about the history of the company, why we came to be a million gallon phytoplankton, zooplankton farm. So a little bit of history will help. Um, so in 1995, Tim Reed, the owner of the company, uh, who still is the CEO and actually operates works in our algae culture, um, he wanted to grow oysters. And to grow oysters in an inland facility you know, that's a biosecure, far from the ocean, no, no disease, no viruses, nothing like that, all, all controlled, um, he wanted to grow oysters. And to do that, to hatch oysters and grow the larvae, you have to feed them phytoplankton. There's really nothing else that substitutes phytoplankton whether it's alive, non-viable. And so uh, he got really good at growing the algae and some oyster growers in California said, well, why don't you find a way to concentrate the algae, find a way to freeze it, refrigerate it for long-term storage and sell that to shellfish growers. And so the light went off in Tim's head. And, and ever since then, we've been working at expanding our facility, growing as many species, different species of marine phytoplankton as possible. And so the species that we chose, we choose are the same ones that are being used in global aquaculture, the ones that people have already had success with. They've, they've put things in research papers, peer-reviewed papers have talked about these things, whether it's diatoms or, or other species of algae. So we only work with the species and strains that are being used in aquaculture. Uh, and so that way, when somebody says, you know, I've got oysters and I want to feed a mysocrisis or pavlova, we have exactly what they need. Um, because because the nutritional profile is very important to these people, and then they, each individual species of phytoplankton has its own nutritional profile. Uh, and so we sell single species uh, products to people that have very specific needs. Um, and we also sell blends of, of algae, uh, which is very important. We found that when you blend species of algae and offer it to your animals, it's way better for them because some species lack certain things. Uh, so for instance, nanochloropsis, which is it's a very easy algae to grow. It's one of the main ones that we grow. And a lot of your viewers have probably grown this in, in two liter bottles or whatever. Um, and so we, we grow a lot of that. And that is, the, that, that is the basis of a lot of our feeds. But nanochloropsis lacks DHA. DHA is an omega fatty acid that's essential for larval, larval development and other things that must come from the diet for those animals. And so to make up for that, we add other species of algae to these blends. Um, and so all the all the species complement each other, and so we have actually become a a source of supplementation or complete replacement for hatcheries. So we have, let's say, an oyster hatchery doesn't want to grow algae, or they can't grow the right species, or they have seasonality issues, or they have continuous crashes. They can call on us because we relieve the bottleneck for them. They can use our products as a supplement for their animals, or they can replace one hundred percent. We have hatcheries, we have a clam hatchery that's replaced completely all of their live algae. They got rid of all of it. And they buy from us, and all they need is a freezer and a refrigerator at their facility. They don't need to set up giant rooms to grow algae, spend a lot of money on electricity. If they're in an area where they can't use the sun or if they're not in a greenhouse, control, crashes, you have to have dedicated staff. It's very expensive. The algae can become contaminated. It's quite literally every day of the week, every week in the year, you have to be on top of it. Algae doesn't take holidays. It doesn't care if you're sick uh, and it doesn't take weekends. You have to be there for it. And so there's a lot of people that do want to deal with that hassle, especially people that need to grow a lot of phytoplankton. We're talking uh, warehouses full of phytoplankton culture. And for, to, to eliminate half of that or all of that is, is huge for those people. They, they can put that cost into other things, that money that's saving. And so that's kind of the bottleneck we really 
you know, leave that bottleneck in, in global aquaculture. Because the cool thing about our products is it can be refrigerated or frozen for long-term storage, and we ship it all over the globe. If there's a country that receive it, and, and we have the importation permits uh, in line, we do vet certification, we have all of our algae tested. And so if all those, if we jump through all those hoops and everything's good, then we can get our algae into those other countries. Uh, and so it's really cool to not just be a part of the domestic aquaculture, but global aquaculture as well. Thank you to Chad for sharing his journey and thank you all for watching. Please stay tuned. I'll be uploading parts two and three of the RMI interview that will be covering Chad's tips, some culturing information, and a closer look at all of the RMI products and processes.